Hi, um, welcome to the Experimenta series with Imagine Science Films. I'm Nona Griffin, Director of Communications with Imagine Science. Um, and this week we have an artist in residence, Amanda Gassai, um, who is a digital artist and also is working at, at Instructables. Um, and she's going to tell us a little bit about her work and kind of walk us through kind of how she got involved with science and art uh, and some of her current projects. Amanda, do you want to tell us a little bit about um, what you do and kind of how you got into this instructable DIY movement? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so I've always been really into uh, math and science. Uh, my dad's a mechanical engineer, and as a kid he was, like, I think even when I was in kindergarten, he was teaching me multiplication and division. Uh, and so I just got, like, a really big, like, head start, and I had just a lot of confidence in this subject, and I, I just, like, kept kind of pursuing it. Um, I was also really interested in building stuff. Um, when I was a kid, you know, I was, like, making a lot of stuff out of paper and cardboard. Um, yeah, I was really into, like, origami and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> hold on a second. Um, yeah, and then when I went into school, I kind of, I was kind of going down like the normal trajectory of, like I was interested in um, molecular biology and chemistry, and I was getting involved with like undergraduate research projects um, and labs and stuff like that. But then eventually I just realized that like I wanted to kind of start working with my hands more, kind of do some of the stuff that I'd been really interested in as a kid, like building stuff. Um, so I... Uh, kind of gravitated towards the physics department because you could, uh, they had the electronics lab and the machine shop and the wood shop and all that stuff. Um, so um, I started, and there was, I guess, like a little bit more opportunities to do more project-based work. Um, so yeah, I, my, one of my first really big projects was this multi-touch uh, music controller. Um, so it was pretty cool. It was a uh, my first, actually, my first project using Arduino, which is this uh, really cool kind of like open source. It's a, it's a, it's basically a tiny computer that you can program and you can um, connect it to sensors and and LEDs and all kinds of stuff. So you can um, you can basically like control hardware with code. Um, and so I built this like multi-touch controller, and I was using that to like drive these uh, audio applications that I was running on my computer, um, and then. I got into another big project I did in the physics department was this mechanical walking machine where I like designed this leg linkage and I built it into this like giant structure. Um, and theoretically, it was supposed to take walk a around. look at that that video if you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> wait, let's let's go to uh, let, uh, let's see. We can actually go to um, the the multi touch screen first. Mm -hmm. um, let's see here. Yeah, so this is it kind of running like a little synthesis application. Um, and some so, kind of interesting things about it, it's uh, it's like an infrared-based multi-touch screen. So, like, you know, I was a student at the time. I was trying to build something really cheap, but and also like kind of as big as possible. Um, so, like, a really cheap way to do multi-touch is to yeah. use infrared light. Um, if you go, actually, I guess that's in my Instructable, but there's like a really good graphic of how it works. Um, but basically the way it works is there's these lasers at the corners of like the screen, and they're, they're shining infrared light across the whole screen. So there's kind of like this very thin, invisible uh, plane of light on the surface of the screen. And then um, when your finger like crosses that um, plane, it scatters light down into the screen, and there's all these little partitions in there, and in each one there's a sensor. And so you can basically figure out kind of the XY coordinate. Um, and, and this was your first project with Arduino? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was definitely really ambitious. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. And the like fabrication is just, like, really well done. The what? The fabrication of it. Oh, it just thanks. looks, like, really really smooth. Yeah, we um, had some really old redwood that was just like sitting around in the physics department. So I got to use that. It's like stuff you just can't even get today. It was, it was like really, really, really nice. Um, and so the next one that I have up is the is the walking machine here. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's fast forward to the part where it's in yeah, motion. Yeah. Here we go.
Yeah, so if you scroll down a little bit, there's like a little animated GIF showing the linkage. Oh, here we go. Yeah. This one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, wait, oh, there you go, yeah. So, uh, so I designed this leg mechanism. So I guess the, the context here is there's this Dutch artist named Theo Janssen who makes these really amazing mechanical, these kinetic sculptures. Um, and they're these, like, kind of walking sculptures. They're all wind-powered, and they, like, walk on the beach in the Netherlands. They're really, really cool. Um, and I was really interested in this project. Um, and I, but I was kind of, he has his, he has, like, his uh, linkage that he uses that he developed, like, in the 90s or something. Um, and he uses it for all of his walking machines. And I was kind of curious to see, like, I, I was like, I know that there must be other solutions to this problem. So I kind of set out to develop my own leg mechanism, and then this is this is kind of showing what I arrived at. Um, so you can see that one part of the linkage is moving in this rotational motion. I guess you can't see it if I'm talking, huh? No, no, you can see it. I, I okay. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, one part of the linkage is moving in this rotational motion, and then another part is. Um, moving in this kind of stepping pattern. You can see it's kind of flat on the bottom, and then it, the foot, that's the joint that's kind of going through that motion, it, it kind of like lifts up, and then it goes down and, and steps, and then lifts wow. up. Um, so I designed that whole thing. Um, <laughs> and you said, though, that it kind of it had some trouble in terms of yeah. carrying <laughs> Well, I really wanted to build it huge, and that was kind of my downfall. So, like, theoretically, the linkage totally works, and it looks on paper really good. Um, but yeah. then I decided to build it, like, really, really massive, and I didn't really know anything about that going into it. <laughs> so <laughs> it did walk, but then it just, like, quickly broke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but it's actually really interesting. So I, like, posted... So um, I haven't written an Instructable about that one, but I did post, like, all of my documentation for it, like, it's somewhere on, like, the physics department's website. Um, and so a lot of people end up finding it. And uh, somebody, like, a couple days ago on Thingiverse, which is this place where you can upload 3D models, somebody modeled it and 3D printed it. Um, oh, wow. So people are actually working on it. So it's kind of cool to see. Um, so hopefully if somebody... <laughs> I, I have a feeling if you print it in a normal size, I think it'll work. <laughs> yeah, a little bit smaller. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess so working at Instructable, is it your day-to-day -day job to make all of these awesome projects and just kind of test it out? I mean, yeah, so I'm kind of like a hybrid um, content maker slash software engineer. So um, I do, like, I work on the website a lot, um, pushing code to the website and working on um, the iOS app. Mm -hmm. But uh, I also get to, you know, we have this amazing shop, like, 200 feet over there, there's like every CNC machine and a, a water jet cutter and like we have a whole room that's just like our digital fabrication lab where we've got laser cutters and 3D printers and all this stuff and then you know wow. we've also got just kind of your basic machine shop, wood shop stuff. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a dream. Like my goal in college was to basically put myself in a position where I had access to a shop like that and it worked out pretty well. So Yeah, that sounds yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, a lot of your projects can be considered both art or science um, and are kind of part of this DIY movement of making these projects really accessible. Um, I guess, do you want to speak a little bit to that um, in terms of, you know, having these projects be so accessible? Um, you know, people around the world are trying to 3D print your, your projects or recreate them themselves. Is that, like, a really important element to what you do, or do you kind of, you know, maybe not see it in that, in that light? Yeah, I mean, I kind of see it as, like, I put a lot of work into something, and I had to do a lot of, like, my own research to kind of, like, get to the point where I made the project. So that since I have all that kind of organized in my head, it kind of makes sense to save someone that work, like, in the future, if they're right. interested in the same <laughs> project. Um, like, you know, I said before I, uh, I started, when I was in college, I started doing, like, the like building the multi-touch stuff and kind of this that's when I kind of started getting into this stuff and definitely like some of the classes I took in college helped get me there but for the most part 
Um, I've learned pretty much all this stuff because other people have posted similar content online. Right. So, and like every single project I do, it's kind of like standing on the shoulders of another project, you know? Like right. another thing I've seen or some information that other people have posted. Like you definitely can't be making this stuff, you know, in isolation. You kind of, you end up like needing a lot of information from the outside world, so it kind of makes sense to uh, continue to kind of post that, that type of stuff. Do you think that you would have kind of gone down the same path um, if you hadn't been so involved with physics and chemistry in college? Um, I really just can't imagine not being involved in that stuff. It's just, I've, I've just been interested in that stuff for, for as long as I can remember, so it kind of makes sense. And I mean, I feel like I was just destined to be an engineer, to be somebody who is, like, building stuff, so I don't know. I guess, do you see it, kind of these scientific principles come through in some of your projects? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely, um, like, so I've been doing a lot of audio stuff, and, like, the 3D printed records, I, I guess, is a good example of this. Um, so that in that project, I was trying to um, write a. So basically, what I did was I wrote a program that takes a piece of music and it um, converts it into a 3D model of a record. And then you can actually 3D print out the record and play it on a regular turntable, and it like plays back a yeah. pretty degraded version of the <laughs> song. But it's. <laughs> but yeah, it's I have it over it. here. Should we should we take a look? I have some images. Sure. Yeah, so, um, so that's actually the laser cut record. The similar, oh, okay. really similar project. Yeah. You can play that one, it's fine. I'll play it, I'll play one of these clips. I think this is Idiotech. <laughs> oh, I think this is Golden Underground. Yeah. So this is um, this is some Fatal Velvet Underground. Hopefully so, you can recognize it. So I guess what is the kind of premise of this project? So this was a really similar project. This was so originally I made the 3D printed records. Um, the resolution you need to 3D print a record is incredibly high, and it's like much higher than the resolution of something like a MakerBot, like some of the kind of more consumer level 3D printers. We have like these industrial strength 3D printers over here, so I was really lucky to be able to use those for this project. But the uh, you know I like posted this instructable, but then I got kind of a lot of um, crap for like I mean the fact that like a normal person wouldn't be able to replicate this project, right? Right. So. Um, one of the things I wanted to do was uh, make it a little bit more accessible. So a lot of people, there's like a lot of places like um, hacker spaces or maker spaces um, where people can get access to laser cutters and they can either get access for free or for very little money. So um, I wanted to try to take that project and just um, translate it into a laser cutting project um, so that more people could mess around with it and actually get a little bit more involved. It's kind of more fun when the projects are a little bit more interactive. Yeah. Were you able um, to, uh, uh, I guess, have other people replicate this with different, giving yeah. them different resources for that? Yeah. I, a couple of people have laser cut records. It's That's pretty great. cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's definitely some, you know, the, I always get a lot of questions because there's like all there's like so many steps where everything could go completely wrong. But uh, but I've seen a couple a couple of videos get posted of like pretty decent records yeah. getting printed. So um, can, what audience do all these pieces reach, or do you hope that they'll reach? Are there people of all ages, or are mostly students, or fellow engineers? I mean, I see people of all ages um, reading them and, and commenting and stuff. I think students tend to be a little bit more active online, like, because they're always trying. I mean, that's like the demographic that's got like a final project coming up, and they're like, Googling and trying to figure out how they're going to get it done. Um, but yeah, I mean, Instructable seems to be a pretty diverse community. So there's like all kinds of people on there. Yeah, definitely. Um, so do you, do you see yourself kind of as a, as a standalone artist, or do you really define yourself as, as an engineer? Um, I'm just kind of like always meandering between 
in the space between those two things, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, like, at points I'll be, like, more doing more kind of, like, art and uh, more kind of creative stuff. Um, but then I always find myself, like, getting stuck in with, like, certain technical tasks that I need to do, and then I'll, like, kind of dive and, like, put on my engineer hat and become, like, more of an engineer and kind of, like, get deeper into more technical stuff. But then at some point I always kind of recoil from that, and it's, like, yeah. Yeah, I so... To, sometimes I just need to get in the shop and get my hands dirty, I guess. <laughs> so one of the most recent um, projects that you have up is it seems really kind of visually based. Um, let me... I'll, I'll share it really quickly. Um... Do you want to talk a little bit uh, kind of to what inspired this project in particular? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is my cat, Teddy. <laughs> he's, <laughs> sometimes he's my muse. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this is... Uh, so one of the things I'm really interested in right now... Um, so, you know, we've got this really amazing shop, um, this CNC shop here. Mm -hmm. And I really want to kind of like push the limits of those machines. Um, so one of the things, I guess, kind of like in my experience getting involved with 3D modeling and CAD, um, it's kind of taken this progression of starting off like doing, using a program like, sorry, like um, Inventor and doing like, um, like modeling where you've got like a 3D object in front of you and you're like pulling it and pushing it and kind of like generating this 3D model. Um, from there I kind of got into writing programs that generate 3D models. Um, so like the 3D printed records was an example of that. Um, and that way you can, you've kind of like, instead of just spending all your time creating a model, you've instead created a workflow so you can like pump lots of data into the program and then you can get like an infinite number of models out. So it's you can kind of get a lot more out of out of the work that you do, mm -hmm. um, but kind of like the next step for that has been like why why am I even writing the program to write the model? I should write a program that writes the program that makes the model. Right. So, <laughs> um, so I've been really interested in um, how we, you know you can use computers to optimize a model, um, and so I've been using something called a genetic algorithm, which is um, an algorithm that's loosely based on the principles of Darwinian evolution, where you've got... Um, so basically what happens is um, when the program executes, it creates um, like a bunch of population of like a bunch of different iterations of some like 3D model. And then it figures out which ones um, are the most fit, so you can define your fitness based on maybe like it performs the best under some like sp some stress or it um, has it's closest to some certain shape or something like that performs some specific function and then uh, um, whichever ones are the most fit you actually mix those together to create the next generation you keep iterating through that and then eventually theoretically you arrive at this like really optimized model um, so the optimized model that that we have shown here is it does this is this recreated every single time the same way, or are there slight variations between every time you run this program? So basically what's happening here is I I started trying to do this stuff with 3D models, and then I realized that genetic algorithms are like really, really, really complicated, and it's really easy to set them up in a way that they just won't converge on anything good. It'll just like go off in a crazy direction. Um, so this was kind of an example of me, I was just trying to like wrap my mind around them a little bit. Um, so I kind of, I like picked a problem where I knew the solution, where I like knew the solution beforehand. So this problem is I want to reconstruct this image of my cat um, using just like triangles, translucent, semi-translucent triangles. Um, so basically what's happening here is um, it's just starting off with a black screen and then each, each it, as this genetic algorithm runs through, it's like adding different triangles um, and kind of like layering them on top of each other and then just seeing which ones, it's just basically going through pixel by pixel and seeing how close it is to the original image. So yeah, if I run this, this, I, this is just showing like the progression of the program when I ran it um, just like a couple weeks ago, but yeah, if I ran it again, it would, 
I mean, hopefully it would converge on a really similar looking image, but it would, you know, like it start. This one starts off with like this big triangle, kind of in the in the lower left corner, like. That would probably be completely different. Um, you know, the way that all the triangles are, are arranged would be completely different, but they'd end up adding together to kind of form a similar yeah. thing. So yeah, it would it would play out in a totally different way. Yeah. So what is the next phase of of this project? Yeah. So um, I feel like yeah. So I've I've definitely got the uh, the two D image stuff down. So now I'm, you know. It, I'm always trying to do projects that are just a little bit outside of what I technically know how to do. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to learn a little bit about finite element modeling next, <laughs> which I don't know anything about. Because <laughs> um, I think that's going to help me um, basically model, basically figure out, you know, because the big problem here is like how do you perform fitness on a 3D object? So the idea behind finite element modeling is you break it up into like a bunch of like kind of finite pieces, like a bunch of like atoms, I guess, like l individual pieces that kind of add up together to form the big model, and then you can like perform uh, simulations and stuff on those, and you can see how it, you know, say you're like trying to ge use a genetic algorithm to create a chair, and you knew that like the chair had to satisfy some certain like structural and like stress kinds of um, uh, considerations. Um, so you could like do a finite element model of the chair and you could, you'd actually be able to get back data and figure out how it's performing under like, you know, someone sitting on it or something like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it, it's definitely a long term <laughs> thing. But I'm also interested in getting back into that, um, that walking machine that I built. Mm -hmm. and I, so I designed that linkage, but I did that all by hand. Um, but I'm really interested in trying to, you know, use a genetic algorithm or something, or some other optimization technique. There's a ton of different ways to do this. Genetic algorithms is one, and I'm really drawn to it because I think that conceptually it's really interesting. Um, but there's, like, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, so, yeah, like trying to find other solutions to that problem, trying to find other linkages. Um, that'd be another kind of cool and, project. And you mentioned, um, I guess, your most recent project that's going to be released, uh, the the Sugar Cube project. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I have it here. I actually got it in an enclosure yesterday and got like everything all finished. Um, gonna publish it next week. Um, so yeah, I don't have it hooked up to audio right now, but you can play that video if you yeah. want. Yeah. So it's a MIDI controller that has an accelerometer in it, so it's like very tactile. Um, it responds to tilt, and it's got these LEDs. It kind of has a visual output. And what is what is a MIDI controller? Um, so MIDI is a it's like a language that electronic instruments use to communicate with each other. So it basically um, you could plug it into like a synthesizer, or you could plug it into like Ableton Live, and it would um, generate audio. <laughs> yeah, that one's really fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically what's happening there is um, you light up one pixel. I can kind of show it here. Um, look at this guy. So um, you light up one pixel, and then it, it uh, just kind of like falls as if it's being affected by gravity. Wow. Um, and each time it goes to a different spot on the grid, it triggers a different MIDI note. Um, so oh, you can wow. like really shake it and do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Um, fun. Yeah. I so there's like a like a really like interactive uh, a children's toy or or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it could yeah, definitely serve a lot of purposes. Sounds and lights up and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's um there's some more so that's kind of like a fun application. It can boot into like a lot of different applications. So if I just like turn it off and turn it on again and like hold down one of the buttons. Um, this is like a step sequencer. Oh wow! So you can see there's this like playhead kind of moving across, and you can like you can like have different notes play. It's kind of overexposed, yeah. but basically like you know whenever the playhead hits like this 
frame, then it would like it would like trigger this note. So there's like four notes here. Each of the columns has a different note. So as the playhead's moving across and it like hits this first lit up pixel, it plays like some like low note. Maybe it's like a kick drum, so it's like. <laughs> but then um, then when it goes here, maybe there's more like a snare or like a hi hat. So it's like. So you can make beats on it and do oh, stuff wow. like that. Um, so yeah, what so, inspired this particular project? Um, so there's a couple uh, instruments out there that are kind of similar. Um, there's a thing called a monom, which is something that I've been really inspired by. It's actually um, the multi-touch screen was like kind of like an adapted version of a monom. Um, and then there's also a thing called a tenori on, which is this instrument made by Yamaha. Um, and they're both like grid-based instruments. They're, they're, they have a lot bigger grid. Um, but um, yeah, this is kind of like some kind of hybrid between the two. Like the cool thing about the monom is it's open source and people can contribute um, their own applications for it and it's like very adaptable. Um, you can basically get it to do whatever you want. The Tenori On is, I mean like, you know, like you would imagine like a, Yama, a Yamaha instrument. It's you can't like pro reprogram it to do other stuff. Like it's pretty closed off. But the cool thing about it is that it's totally standalone. Um, the monom has to be plugged into your computer, and your computer is kind of doing like the heavy lifting of like running the applications. Um, so this is kind of like a hybrid. I was trying to, you know, I wanted to make it like really open, and I've posted all the code online, so it's like totally open. And I'll be posting the instructable soon, so you could even build your own or any, you know, <laughs> whatever you want. Um, or modify it or do whatever, but it's also really portable. It's got like a battery. Um, eventually, I want to hook it up to a uh, to like a Bluetooth um, output, so it can actually send MIDI over Bluetooth, and then I could get the <laughs> hopefully. And I'm not even totally sure this is possible, but hopefully, the idea is that I uh, receive the MIDI on my phone, so that I could actually like convert the MIDI to audio on my phone. So then it'd be like a totally portable device. Like you wouldn't need a computer. You wouldn't need to be plugged into anything. So you could like take it on the train. Uh, one <laughs> of the things like that I'm always interested in doing is getting electronic instruments out of like the traditional environment where they are, which is just like the studio, you know, and just right, kind of like yeah. making things more portable. Um, <laughs> now I'm imagining like all of the different uh, subway musicians in New York <laughs> on these <laughs> yeah. really high tech Arduino operating <laughs> instruments. <laughs> totally. Oh yeah, this whole thing's powered by an Arduino. I can kind of open it up if you want to see. Yeah, that would be great. This front panel is just kind of like press fit on there. So um, this is the controller that, or this is kind of like the the button pad, um, and these are all the LEDs soldered onto it. You can get this at SparkFun. It's a really, really fun component to use. Um, buttons are just like these silicon things that go on top. Um, so, uh, I put a bunch of tape on stuff because there was wires touching each other yesterday, <laughs> causing all kinds of problems. But there's a battery. Um, there's this little USB to MIDI converter. And then the Arduino is somewhere here under this, like, Massive tape. There's also an accelerometer and gyroscope in there, and a couple chips to control the buttons and the LEDs. So, how long have you been working on this project for? Um, you know, I started this project so long ago, like I want to say a year and a half ago, <laughs> but then I kept getting caught up in other stuff and. You know, it's just been crazy. So I, I like, really um, been trying to be really disciplined, like, in the last couple of weeks and just yeah. get it out. I ended up actually totally rewriting the code because between the time where I started it and um, now, I, like, that's when I started getting into, um, on. that's when I started uh, working on the engineering team at Instructables. So, like, I've just become a way better programmer in the past year. And I kind of, like, came back to the project. And I was like, this com this has to be completely rewritten. So I've, like, totally restructured <laughs> everything. <laughs> Is there generally a lot of troubleshooting with these type of projects? Um... I mean, honestly, this project hasn't been too bad. Like, I'm mean, not, you know, the only reason it's taken so long is just because I can't stay focused for long enough to finish it. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, like, you know, everything with electronics, it never works right the first time, so you've got to 
constantly, be, and, and you know, you got electronics and you got code, like there's all these invisible things at play and so you're never really sure like what's screwing stuff up. Um, but I definitely, you know, I've been doing this for a while now and I've got kind of a process and it's very methodical. Um, so I've got, you know, I have a system for, for getting these things done without uh, losing my mind, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, we look forward to seeing uh, what you have in store next and for yeah. the release of, of this um, Sugar Cube project on Instructables yeah. next week. Um, really cool. Thank you so much, and, and you know, we'll, we'll keep everyone posted on your upcoming works, uh, yeah. and, and we hope to have you back on our show. <laughs> cool. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>